It is a pleasure to welcome you to second edition of the lecture series on advancements in geotechnical engineering, from research to practice. The AGERP lecture series is a pro bono initiative led by Dr. Partha Mishra and Professor Sarat Das. Initiated in 2020, it is aimed at disseminating the coupled learnings from academia and industry on some of the key topics in geotechnical engineering. Today's lecture is on soil erosion, which will be delivered by Professor Jean-Louis Briord and Mr. Amir Sharkolahi. ASCE President Jean-Louis Briord is a distinguished professor and holder of the Spencer J. Buchanan Chair in the Zachary Department of Civil Engineering at Texas A&M University, a distinguished member of the American Society of Civil Engineers, and a licensed professional engineer in Texas. He has served as president of the Association of Geotechnical Engineering Professors and president of the Geo Institute of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Briar Ord's expertise is in foundation engineering and more generally geotechnical engineering. He has also worked as a consultant on numerous projects, including highway embankments, oil tanks, dams, bridges, levees, shallow and deep foundations and soil erosion. It's a pleasure to, to be with you. You've really started something that's pretty impressive. When I see the attendance, the number of countries, I really commend you for uh, you know, making this happen because especially in this day and age with the virus propagation, uh, you know, this online medium becomes extremely important. So um, congratulations again. Uh, I'm gonna talk about soil erosion and design applications. And the first thing I want to do, so the, the talk is in uh, three parts, if you wish. The first one is uh, to show you through a few movies uh, what kind of cat catastrophe disasters can be created by soil erosion. And uh, hopefully after this, I will have convinced you that it's an important topic in geotechnical engineering. Uh, then I will show you, uh, I will discuss the fundamental behavior of the soil when it's subjected to flowing water. And, uh, and then in the last part, I will talk about four case histories um, where erosion played a very important role and, uh, and then uh, some conclusions. There we go. So <clears throat> here's an example. This is a movie, but before I start the movie, I wanted to show you the river is coming this way and it's a meander, it takes a corner here and it's eroding the foundation of this building and see what happens as the erosion takes place. So that's, so the meander migration is definitely a problem. This is the Oroville Dam accidents. The Oroville Dam is the largest dam in the United States. And in 2017, unfortunately, the video that, that I found on YouTube uh, doesn't work um, through this medium for some reason. But Orville Dam was uh, the, the largest dam in the country, but through 300 uh, meters high. And uh, the uh, spillway uh, had to be used in February of 2017. And the concrete spillway actually uh, the concrete slab lifted off and the water started to erode the material, the soil underneath it. And it, it created a lot of damage. Fortunately, the dam did not breach, uh, so it could have been a lot worse. Uh, this one is now going back to 1987. You're looking at uh, the collapse of a bridge. Ten people died and uh, shallow foundation on glacial till. And here is the collapse of the second span of that bridge as the foundation was moving. Uh, let me, and this is now, we're in Germany, northern Germany, a levee, uh, 1954. And here is on this side, here is the North Sea. And the water is, uh, through the waves, is going over the, this levee, which is relatively unprotected. Uh, and you're going to see how the erosion takes place. Uh, the North Sea, then you, you have uh, high tide combined with a storm. So you have a storm surge that brings the water level on the other side of the levee to, uh, to, to ride over that levee. And you can see how the soil is starting in the levee is starting 
to erode and, and how slowly but surely that levee is going to be eroded. And if we were to play the movie long enough, uh, then you would see the breach of the levee and how the North Sea is actually coming into on the land side of this, uh, of this levee. And we have other examples. Uh, maybe some of you have been to Niagara Falls. Uh, Niagara Falls uh, it is uh, between Lake Ontario and Lake Carrier uh, on, on the border between the United States and Canada. And uh, this uh, fall is regressing. So the water is flowing from the, the right side here to the left side. And you can see how the horseshoe falls in Niagara where in 1841, we're at this location and 2006, uh, and this is rock erosion in that case. So 11 kilometers of lateral erosion from Lake Ontario towards Lake Erie in 12,000 years. So the rate is not very large, very high, 0.1 millimeter per hour, but over time, 12,000 years, then this, these falls have traveled 11 kilometers. And the next example is the Grand Canyon. Again, in the United States, 1,600 meter of vertical erosion by the Colorado River in 10 million years. And it created this huge hole and the Colorado River is at the bottom here. Whoops, uh, let me go back up. Uh, Colorado River is at the bottom right here. And in 10 million years, it actually dug a hole through the, uh, through the canyon. And if you divide 1,600 meters, by 10 million years, you get a rate of 0 0.00002 millimeter per hour. So if I were to tell you that the rate is gonna be 0 0.00002 millimeter per hour, you would say this is negligible. And in the meantime, you probably would be neglecting the Grand Canyon. So the idea is that it's not just the rate of erosion, but how long the erosion is gonna take place, in this case, a huge amount of time. By the way, this is my son, Patrick, here. So you can see all those problems that uh, erosion creates. And then you can ask yourself, if your faucet drips on a pebble for 20 million years, will there be a hole in the pebble? And I'll let you answer that question in your own mind, uh, because uh, the pebble is extremely strong. The water is extremely weak, but very likely, several of you or many of you will say, yes, there would be a hole in the pebble. So the question is why? How is that possible for the water to defeat the bonds of that strong material and make a hole in the pebble? So these are a few uh, examples of significant impact that erosion can have on our structures and on nature. Let's talk about uh, an erosion problem. Let's move to now to the fundamentals of erosion. So an erosion problem is always made of three components, the soil, the water, and the geometry of the obstacle that is in front of the water. If you consider, uh, let, let's say that now you're at the bottom of a lake and you're this yellow particle. And you're in equilibrium because you have a certain hydrostatic pressure above the particle. You have a little bit higher hydrostatic pressure at the bottom of the particle because you go deeper. Uh, but the uplift force on that particle is smaller than the weight of the particle. And so the particle is in equilibrium. Now, if the water starts moving, in other words, instead of a lake, you're at the bottom of the river and the, you're still at that particle right here. What do you feel? What happens is typically the water pressure will decrease because of the flow on top of the particle. The water pressure underneath will not decrease because it's protected from the flow. You will also have a shear force, uh, the hydraulic shear force. So it's very small. It's like blowing on your hand. You know, it's, it's extremely small, but yet it is that shear force that's actually the reason for the erosion process and the problems that I've shown you in those movies previously. So I want to show you another movie and the water is going to come from the left 
to the right, we're in a river, it's a simulated river, it's an experiment. And then here is the pier of a bridge. You see the bridge deck here, and we're gonna run this experiment. And you can see the sand. Uh, in the second part, you will see a pile. And I'll try to point out to you how the particles of sand are dancing around the pile and being eroded as a flow. Here is the pile. So look at those uh, soil particles here. They're being, the, the flow is coming this way and it's digging the hole around the pier as the particle move up the slope and out into the flow. So let's define soil erosion. Uh, erosion is a relationship. It's not a single number. It's a relationship between the erosion rate and the velocity of the water near the soil water interface. That's the first definition. Actually, this definition is not very satisfactory because the water velocity varies in the water depth and actually is zero at the interface between the water and the soil. So this is not a very satisfactory. It's, it's one that's relatively easy to understand, but it's not from a scientific point of view, it's not a very satisfactory one. A better one is the second one here, the relationship between the erosion rates how fast the erosion is taking place and the shear stress at the soil water interface. So we're gonna take Z dot as the erosion rate and tau as the shear stress. So this is the constitutive law for soil erosion. Just like we have, uh, you know, elasticity for deformation. This, this equation, the blue one there is the constitutive law for soil erosion. And as good geotechnical engineers, you know, anytime we have a problem, we say, okay, well, let's go to the field, take a sample, bring it back to the lab, and we'll test it to see how hard it is, how deformable it is, in this case, how erodible it is. So here is the Shelby tube, the, this uh, silver looking thing here, the Shelby tube that we go to the field and we bring it back to the lab and we put it underneath this conduit where the, the water is going to flow. It's going to go this way, up in the tube, back in the back, coming back here. So there's a closed circuit and the water continues to erode the material here. So here's the cross section. The gray area is the soil in the Shelby tube. We have a piston at the bottom and we push the soil up only as fast as it is eroded by the water flowing over it. So we develop Right, so the water goes 0.5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 meters per second. And we generate a certain shear stress at the interface between the soil and the water. And so here is the erosion function, that relationship between the erosion rate and the shear stress. And you can see that up to a certain velocity or shear stress, there is no erosion. The soil is able to sustain the water flow without eroding. And then there's a critical threshold called the critical shear stress or critical velocity uh, located right here. <clears throat> and at this point, the erosion starts. And the erosion starts as you continue to increase the flow velocity. This is the erosion function. That's the fundamental uh, law that describes erosion of a soil, a rock, a, a uh, weathered uh, soil or, or whatever. And so we built this machine in the early 90s and we've been testing a lot of soils and rock ever since that time. So here's the machine. Uh, you're gonna see, let me start the movie. And here we're testing sand. So this tube is right here. And at the bottom, you have a piston here that's pushing the sand up and up and up and up. And the sand is being, and the water is flowing this way. And you can see that the water is eroding the sand uh, as we push the sand up into the, so the, the piston rate is the erosion rate and the water velocity we measure with the flow meter. This is a porcelain clay. So this is a man-made clay, very uniform. We're going actually twice as fast as with the sand. You see nothing because the material is able to resist that, that velocity. So there's no erosion in this case. If anything, there's erosion particles of clay by particles of clay. Here is a real material from a bridge site. 
And you can see that in this case, the erosion is blocks of particles by blocks of particles, slowly but surely. And, and so this is, this is a clay, a fine grain soil. It has some cohesion and yet it's being eroded, being eroded blocks of particles by blocks of particles. So I showed you the sand, I showed you the porcelain clay and now the, uh, the, the real clay. You can see that those three parts show different types of erosion processes. And so in the end, what we get is those erosion functions. And I'll, I'll uh, so this is shear stress, this is velocity. So I'm gonna look on the right here. Here is the erosion rate or scour rate as a function of velocity. This is the sand I showed you. The D50 was 0.3 millimeters. And you can see that the sand could take about maybe 0.2 meters per second before it started to erode. And if I go to one meter per second, I've got 1000 millimeter per hour, one meter per hour of erosion rate. If I now show you what the clay was doing, the second clay, the porcelain clay, the man-made clay, not the one from the bridge. And I show you again, scour rate as a function of velocity. If I go back to the same one meter per second, you see the clay is only eroding one millimeter per hour. The sand for the same velocity was at 1000 millimeter per hour. The clay is at one millimeter per hour, huge difference. So erosion or erodibility is significantly dependent upon the soil type. At the same time, so knowing that we've created uh, an uh, uh, erosion chart, if you wish, where we put the erosion rate on the vertical axis and the velocity on the uh, horizontal axis. And you can see that if you have low velocity but high erosion rate, you're in very high erodibility material. These are fine sand, for example, like I showed you. At the same time, if you go to uh, some high velocities, like two, three meters per second, and relatively low erosion rate, then now you're in high plasticity, silt, low plasticity clay, uh, and, it, and, and as you go further and further, you go into the jointed rocks and intact rocks where you can go to very high velocity and still get relatively little erosion. So this is a chart we use a lot. And you have the same chart, but in terms of shear stress. One of the uh, uh, critical issues, and I, and I showed it to you, on the, uh, the, the erosion function apparatus, you know, the, the, the tool that we developed is with the Shelby tube that we call the EFA. In the CFA, we can detect the first time where the velocity starts to erode the material. We call that the critical velocity. This critical velocity is plotted here from many experiments that we've run and others have run uh, versus the mean grain size. And you can see sort of a U-shaped curve. On the right-hand side, you're looking at sand, gravel, riprap, uh, particles of soil that behave because of their weight, of gravi gravity forces. And you can see that in this case, the critical velocity is proportional to the grain size. And we have, a, because it's log-log, we have a regression line here that gives you an estimate of this critical velocity as a function of D50. What happens, however, when you go into the silts and the clays here, the fine grained soils, first of all, the direction is reversed. Uh, and the reason for this is that for these fine grained soils, the critical velocity is no longer dependent on the weight of the particle because number one, they're extremely light. Uh, so they would, according to, if it was the weight that controlled it, they would be eroded in no time at all. But what counts more for these particles is the electrostatic and electromagnetic forces that exist between those clay particles. And these forces are the forces that make those high plasticity clays, for example, much more resistant to erosion than a fine sand. The problem on the side of the fine grain soil is that the D50 no longer is a determining factor. And you have a range of uh, curves, if you wish. And that's why 
when I deal with, with soils that are on this side of this uh, chart, then I have to test the soil. And, and I, I use the EFA to do that. So the same, uh, same chart, but in terms of critical shear stress uh, in, this, uh, in this case. So many people ask me, well, uh, can't you get me a, you know, a simple equation that relates the uh, erodibility of the material to uh, index properties? And I've tried to do that for 30 years and I have failed miserably. <laughs> and uh, several problems. Number one, I made a list here of all the properties of soils that would impact the erodibility of the soil. And you can see there are a lot of them. The erodibility depends on the soil properties, but it depends on many of the typical soil properties that we know. And so if you want to do a regression or correlation of some sort, you're going to have to put all those parameters on the, on the, uh, the regression side. Uh, and the second problem is, as I explained, erodibility is not a single number. It's a relationship. It's a relationship between erosion rate versus velocity or erosion rate versus shear stress. So it's difficult to correlate a, uh, a curve, if you wish, to a set of numbers. And we tried to answer this in, in doing a, a, you know, some simplification. But again, I don't have a good one. And uh, I'm, I'm comfortable saying uh, if you have an erosion problem, that is large enough. Uh, in terms of budget and importance and impact and consequence, then testing is very important. That's what we do in geotech. Uh, I deal with a lot of hydraulic engineers and uh, while well, they're all my friends, uh, they think differently. And to them, testing is not something that seems to be in their DNA. And, and so it's always a bit of a surprise when you say, well, we'll take a soil sample, bring it to the lab, test it, and we'll tell you how it behaves. All right, so to try now to solve some of these main problems associated with erosion, I showed you the first movie was meander migration. We used experimental approaches, but we also used numerical approaches. So we've got a lot of fancy equation. I'll pass on this because it's no fun. And then we're able to do this. And unfortunately, this movie doesn't work. But the water, this is a, the result of a numerical simulation. The water is flowing from bottom left to top right. And if the movie worked, you could see how the, this uh, numerical simulation allows you to create the hole that would be, because you got two phenomenons here. One is the narrowing of the river. You have an embankment that's blocking the river and you have the narrowing. So you have a contraction scour issue. And then you have the, the, the piers, the bridge piers that are blocking the way to the water. So that accelerates the water and then you create a, a hole. More recently, we've started to work with the discrete element method for erosion studies. And in the previous uh, numerical simulation result that I showed you where the movie didn't work, we're using finite element method in dynamics, X, Y, Z, and T. And we're able to dig the hole by an interface model uh, between the water and the soil. With the discrete element method, which is a more recent method, we're able to simulate each particle by itself so that when the water flows, we can actually move the particle and truly erode the particle, uh, the soil particle by particle. So we're able, for example, you see in this case, we have a bunch of particles in that uh, Shelby tube and we're flowing the water this way and we're able to actually create the erosion of the material particle by particle. And, and uh, we le we're learning a lot by doing that. We're looking at the effect of, um, you know, one of the puzzles and I alluded to this with the, the pebble, you know, the water that drips on the pebble. Uh, why is it that in foundation engineering, for example, we talk about soil shear strength in kilopascal, 50 kilopascal, 100 kilopascal. This is typical numbers of, uh, of shear strength in soil. But when it comes to erosion, 
the tau, the loading, is in pascals. In other words, the shear stresses that we subject the soil to through erosion processes is about a thousand times less than the shear stresses we impart on the soil under a foundation. And yet, with these very small shear stresses, we're able to destroy the soil particle by particle, erode the soil particle by particle. Why is that? And I think the key is that the scale is dramatically different. When we talk about foundation engineering, we're talking about many cubic meters of soil. When we talk about erosion, we're talking about uh, micrometers, if not nanometers of scale. And it makes you rethink the, the Coulomb equation, the shear strength equation, when we write S equals C prime plus sigma prime tangent phi prime. I believe that that C prime component, which to me is extremely important and that we have a hard time quantifying properly in geotechnical engineering is a key to understanding soil erodibility. All right, let's now go to um, the case histories. So I'm gonna to talk to you about three case histories because all these fundamental issues, uh, you know, so what? Like my father would have said, he was a contractor. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what? Uh, well, we need to apply this to full scale projects. And I've selected four projects here. The first one is a bridge. The second one is a meander problem. The third one is a cliff erosion problem. And the last one is levees overtopping and the New Orleans disaster. So let's talk about the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. So we're going to Washington DC. Uh, this is the old bridge right here uh, uh, view. So we're in Washington DC. And uh, the first thing that I wanna tell you is that Bridge scour, erosion of soil around bridge supports is the number one killer of bridges. 60% of all bridge failures are due to scour. Are these, at least these are statistics uh, in the United States. So it's a big issue for bridges over rivers. So there was a problem with the old bridge and the new bridge was gonna be built. Uh, here are the soil layers. There's a main channel and a secondary channel. Let's concentrate on the main channel because that's the deepest part of the river. So we have soft clay, organic soft clay right here, 20 meters. And below that, 30 meters of hard clay. Some dense sand, loose sand layer, but very small. So soft clay or soft organic clay over hard clay. 20 meters soft clay, 30 meters hard clay. Here is the stratigraphy. This is the main channel. So all the ships go back and forth in here. And we're gonna have two huge bascule bridges so that we can open up uh, the bridge when the big ships have to go through. And these are uh, very large uh, structures requiring significant uh, foundations. So we went to the site, took some samples, brought them back to the lab, tested them in the FA, and we had some elements to make some predictions. Uh, here are the erosion examples of erosion functions, as I showed you before. We got the discharge to, from, from past uh, records for that river, the Potomac River, uh, that goes through Washington, DC. And uh, with that and the scale and the size, the geometry of the pier, we made some predictions of how big a hole a 500 year storm would create uh, around the bridge pier, because that has an impact on how deep the piles will have to be. And here are predictions. You see the flow at the, at the top, flow versus time, and then the scour depth as a, as a function of time below that. That's our prediction after adding a 500 year storm and spiking the hydrograph for the 500 year storm. Others, there were a number of consultants that came into this big project and uh, to compare notes so that the client could, uh, the, the client representative could um, uh, have a, you know, a multi-component uh, 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 prediction of what the, the scour would be 
and then make a decision on the final one. So others uh, predicted the, uh, the depth of scour based on uh, flume test experiments. But you see here, you note that the soil is fine sand. So the soil is fine sand when in fact the soil at the site was soft clay over stiff clay. So we'll have to remember this. All right, so the consultants get back into a room and everybody compares notes. You can see, and I, and I uh, took the names of the people out, but the techniques that they used are listed here. So most of them you see say 20 meters, that the hole considering the size, the large size of that pier, the big hole due to the founder just term would be 20 meters deep. Here is Brio coming from Texas and m and say, uh-uh, 11.5 meters. So people say, now wait a minute, uh, the, something is wrong. You're totally an outlier. And Mike, and then somebody was at 30 meters. Okay. So I'm trying to defend <laughs> defend my predictions in front of a number of people. And uh, I say, well, you know, I took some samples at the site. Did anybody look at the samples at the site? No. Uh, well, what did you do? We assume fine sand. I said, but it's not fine sand. It's soft clay, organic soft clay. And it turns out that that organic soft clay be behaves like mayonnaise. And, and try to get a feel for eroding mayonnaise. It's difficult to erode mayonnaise because it's very sticky. It's very soft, but it's very sticky. So, um, and, and we were able to check our methodology against observation on the old bridge. So we felt comfortable, but in the end they said, well, your methodology is to, this was like uh, almost 20 years ago. They said, this is 15 years ago. So they said, this is too recent. We can't believe that we'll go with 20 meters. So the bridge was built with 20 meters of scour estimation. You can see the depth of the piles here that go to about, uh, what is this, 65 meters depth. And you can see them uh, driving those uh, about two meter diameter pipe piles uh, at the site. And here is the bascule bridge. That's one half of the bridge. I'm on the half that's completed taking that picture. And this is the old bridge here. So that's our first, um, our first uh, case history. The second one is a meander. Uh, case history. So we're coming close to home. Uh, you see, this is uh, where we are here in Texas. And, and that's basically where I live. This meander is only about uh, 20 kilometers from uh, where I live. This is the Brazos River. So it takes a meander right there. And whoops, we're going too fast. Uh, the meander is here and it comes back. And here's the bridge. The, the highway comes here and the highway department, uh, department of transportation is worried because this meander is starting to move and move and approaching dangerously the embankment here. And they're thinking about relocating the bridge to, to buy some time. So they asked us to look at that and, and see what, uh, what we thought about the problem. So we looked at how much this river had had moved 1981, 1995, 2006. To give you an idea of scale, uh, this is 100 meters. So that river had moved from the green to the orange here. That's probably 150 meters uh, lateral movement in about 25 years. So si significant. Uh, and, and look at uh, 1969, the river is here, that distance, 1999, the river has moved much closer. And of course, if you look at it on the aerial view here, the movement, so this farmer is really upset because he's losing a lot of ground. But this farmer is really happy because he's gaining a lot of ground, doing nothing. So this is a channel movement as a function of time uh, as recorded. If you look carefully at what happens and how the meander migration and the erosion process take place, look, I took a picture of what's happening in that orange circle. And here is what's happening. The water is flowing this way. It undercuts, it undercuts the cliff or the bank of the river. And you, you can see the sloughing 
of uh, sort because there is a sand layer at the bottom here. This is clay material, and there is undercutting at the bottom. The material sloughs in, and uh, the water erodes these chunks of soil, and the the most erodible one part, the fine sand, is deposited on the inside of the meander because the water is moving in a helical flow current. So that's why these inside uh, sand deposits take place because the water takes it from the outside and brings it back on the inside, takes it from the outside, brings it back on the inside, takes it from the outside, brings it back on the inside. So that's the typical movement of, uh, of a meander. So as I showed you, we did these very large, you can see the size in the, in the white circle here of, the, of this person. Uh, it, it's very large scale. It, took, it would take about two months to prepare one experiment. So uh, when it's like this, you don't want to mess it up when you run the, the experiment. And then we did it also in clay. So this was in sand. So we lined the side of these meanders with clay and we repeated the experiment. We did some tests in the FA. We did some numerical simulations. And one thing we learned is that if you, if, if you look at the, the radius of the meander, okay, here is a meander here. Here is the radius of the meander and the width of the river. And the ratio of radius of meander over width is very important. If you have a very large radius over width, which is this picture here, you probably, your meander won't move very fast. If you have a very small R of a W like this, the river will have a tendency to straighten itself. But if you have an R of a W of the order of two or three, then that's the worst case. There seems to be a resonance that takes place between the water flow going from one side to the other and, and it really destroys uh, and, and the meander. So when you, when you look at a river, take a look at the R of a W and see, and that will help you see if you have a, a big problem or not. So we developed a, a software package meander to be able to, to predict uh, these meander migration. Let's go to France, Normandy cliffs. So Normandy is the site. So we're in, uh, here's Paris. And this is the Normandy cliffs here, or the, the uh, D-Day, where in 1944, June 6, 1944, uh, the, the armies from Australia, Canada, United States, England, uh, assaulted those beaches. And one of the sites was made of cliffs. And you see the cliffs here. Uh, this is called Pointe du Hoc. Uh, and, and these cliffs, so you see all the holes that are made by the bombs, the bombing that took place prior to the assault of those cliffs. Uh, it, it's, uh, and, and to me, uh, it, it's, it was a very special project because basically all of those young people that came and to, they, they came essentially prepared to sacrifice their lives to come and deliver my parents. And, and uh, that's why to me, I wasn't born at the time, but, but uh, shortly thereafter. And, and uh, so forever grateful, no doubt. Uh, anyway, so from the erosion point of view, so this is the bombardment, uh, 1944, repeated bombardment, and then D-Day on 6 June, 1944. Uh, General Earl Ryder, who became president of Texas A&M University uh, after the war and 200 rangers uh, uh, scaled up the cliffs of uh, Point du Hoc. And so there are monuments uh, on top of the cliffs that are uh, memories of the, of the battle uh, where a lot of uh, young people died. And so the American uh, government didn't want to lose those monuments because the cliffs were retreating and uh, the monuments were about to fall into the sea. And so there was a, an effort to, uh, to save those monuments by arresting the, the, the erosion process. So here is a cross section. You have this monument that you saw 
on the previous picture. And there is a cross section. You silty clay at the top, you have limestone, sandstone, limestone, and then limestone again. This is the cliff. It's about 22 meters high. And what happens is a tremendous tide and storm waves. You see six meters here. You're not very far. If you, if you know a little bit about uh, this area of France, it's close to the Mont Saint-Michel. And Mont Saint-Michel has tremendous tides variation. And so this is six meters high, seven meters. So there's a 13 meter range of tides at that location. It's, it's uh, fantastic. And these waves actually dig caverns at the bottom of the cliffs. And when the caverns become too deep, this chunk of rock falls down and that creates a set of uh, an erosion process, uh, these large chunks at a time. So we went to the site and uh, did the, the, the usual soil sampling and, and rock coring. We tested them. What's amazing with cliffs is that you certainly see the stratigraphy right in front of you. Uh, and, and then we tested them in the uh, EFA, but that was not the issue because the rock was very strong against erosion. The, the issue in this case was these caverns at the bottom. And you can see them here with the, uh, the size of this person, caverns that are, uh, and, and those blocks of rock, of fissured rocks that are, the, the joints are washed by the waves and, and the, the blocks are, are falling down and being washed into the sea. So here is the wave attack. And so the, the force is large. And then when the wave retrieves, then this force sucks the block outward. And after many, many wave cycles, it pulls and makes a hole. We did simulations to show what kind of stresses we had in the rock mass. And here's an example of a big, you can see the people here in that, uh, on the cliff and, and uh, that big rock mass. Incidentally, we tested the rock intention and we got, uh, I forget the exact value, but then we test, we uh, calculated from the overhang, if I go back to this one here, we calculated the tensile stresses that exist in this plane where this overhang would actually uh, overload this, the rock in tension. And the tension that breaks the rock mass was 100 times less than the tension of the rock, the intact rock specimen. So again, that, that reemphasizes the issue that in rock engineering, the rock mass properties are critically important and often very different from the intact rock properties. So we put the, uh, we backfilled the caverns and we put the uh, monument on micro piles and that uh, solved the problem. All right, let's go to New Orleans to finish uh, this uh, presentation. And uh, New Orleans uh, is a wonderful place that I enjoy very much. The food is wonderful. The music, the jazz is something I enjoy as well but it really faced a tremendous problem in 2005. Uh, Hurricane Katrina came over 29 August, 2005 and really devastated the, the city. Storm surge, when you have this big mass of, uh, of air flowing and pushing the water, dragging the water, there's a storm surge that's created and it comes. So here is New Orleans, Mississippi River, is right here, comes down into the Gulf of Mexico. This is Lake Pontchartrain, Lake Bourne. The hurricane came this way. And you see the size of the, um, of, of the uh, storm surge, 8.5 meters. Uh, 8.5 meters, that's a three-story building. So you got a wave that's three-story building coming at you. And here, 4.6 meters, here, three meters. Typically, the levees are about five meters high around New Orleans. But with the waves, if you remember the, the, the video that I showed you at the beginning in the North Sea of Germany, the waves can reach over 
and, and uh, really overtake the, uh, the levees. You can see examples of overflow, these ships being on top of highways. And here is another one on top of a levee. So obviously the water was very high. Here is a barge on top of an eye wall. Um, uh, here is another a close up of this. So you can imagine the strength and the power of the water in a hurricane. And you get a lot of respect for, for that water. Here's some more of those uh, ships and on top of, uh, of the highway. And, and the problem is, is this, is that you've got the Mississippi River here, you have Lake Pontchartrain on this side, uh, and, and New Orleans is essentially a bathtub. And uh, the, we rely on the levees on both sides to make sure that the city stays dry, but if the levees fail, it's dramatic. So here's an example of a levee. You see, levees are pretty flat. They're, they're not big walls, like, but they're, they're, the slopes are pretty gentle, pretty flat, and the height is only about five meters. So the hurricane came this way and over, over top the levee, but minimal damage here. You see a little bit of erosion, but overall the levee did well. Here's another case. The hurricane came this way and there's nothing left. The levee was over top, but was made of a different material and that material didn't resist and it was gone. So we went to the site of these levees and took a number of samples, tested them in the FA, and here's what we got. You can see erosion rate versus velocity. The first thing that strikes you, it's all over the place. So these levees are made of very, very different material. And if you have a levee that's made of this material, you're in good shape. If you have a levee that's made of this material, you better start running. So we were able to identify which levees were overtopped and resisted and which levees were overtopped and failed. And from this, we generated a uh, levee overtopping chart saying, if the material you test is within this zone, then you're probably prone to failure by overtopping. If you're in this zone, you probably can resist overtopping for a few hours. And then here you have the transition zone. So that, that helped us to do that. Conclusion, scour and erosion is a large field of civil engineering. Bridge scour, cliff erosion, levee erosion, meander migration, piping and dams, I didn't talk about this. Construction sites, surface erosion, highway embankments, beach erosion. Geotechnical engineers need to get involved as the soil and rock side of the field, practice and research, is seriously lagging behind the hydraulic side. So if you are interested in uh, you know, developing this side, there's a, lo a lot of work to be done and geotechnical engineers need to, to be involved. I'll finish with this one to try to set up my colleague who's coming next as a speaker because erosion countermeasures are very important. How are we gonna protect ourselves against this? And I've mentioned a few here that I've worked on uh, and, and made some comments. Grass on levees, for example, can help a lot, up to six meters per second. Unfortunately, grass is weather sensitive. Lime works well, but it's not environmentally friendly because it generates some chemicals. Riprap is very common, but you have to put a filter between the riprap and the soil. And geosynthetic filters are uh, the, the, you know, the, the choice uh, in many cases. Enzymes is a new field. Enzymes are protein, you know, you have them in your, in your liver, so they're environmentally friendly, but they only work for certain soils. Geosynthetics are very convenient, but make sure that you're comfortable with the cost. And then concrete cover, be careful with discontinuities. That's what happened to Orville Dam, where a, a plate at the joints was lifted off and there was no concrete cover anymore. With this, I thank you for your attention and I will be happy to answer any questions if there are any. So let me start with, uh, this is Wesley. So can you provide a case study example on how to mitigate risks warranted by flash flood hazard at the road embankment site 
located near the foothills? Uh, yeah, so mitigation, and uh, I guess it's a good uh, setup for our next uh, speaker. Um, on, on the road side, uh, erosion protection, I would say uh, grass is probably one of the uh, least expensive and most natural protection that uh, you can have. If uh, and, and again, grass, there are many different types of grass, and it's not just a matter of, uh, of putting any grass on the surface. Uh, so th this has to be studied. And there's a period of time when you put the grass on uh, that the grass has to grow and, and, uh, and establish itself. Uh, so there is a period there where you don't have any protection. If uh, th there's no doubt that uh, mat geosynthetic uh, protection is a very good and uh, expanding field for erosion mitigation. Um, again, the, the cost has to be considered, um, but uh, you, you, you know, that last slide, uh, enzymes is an interesting solution, you know, where you can mix the enzyme with the soil and it does give you uh, uh, a certain level of protection. So the, you know these are, are so two things. I, I think the most common for embankments uh, uh, and uh, highway embankments and levees uh, would be grass and, and geosynthetic. Yeah, thank you. So that is another query from Devansu uh, from India. So you are discussing about this Meander software. So his query is, what are the capabilities of Meander software? What we can do with that software? Uh, well, the, the, basically the, the, the software takes the shape of the river and you input, uh, you input a, uh, a it, it works best when you have some history, some, uh, past history of the river. In other words, if you observe a certain, uh, you know, for 10, 20, 30 years, if you observe the movement of the river through aerial photos, uh, uh, you know, satellite imagery, if you have some documents, uh, then you can use that to calibrate the software. And then the software will predict what will happen to that river. Uh, you, you choose a certain direction and it tells you, uh, once it's calibrated on past history, it will tell you where the river is going to go for the next 5, 10, 20 years, depending on what you, what you input. In the process, you have to input the, uh, the soil uh, uh, erosion category, you know, and the erosion function. Uh, and you have to input the, the flow uh, as well. So these are the two things. And the, the software is free. I'll be I'll be glad to uh, send it to whoever wants to. It's in the form of a spreadsheet, basically. Next question is from Juan. Is the critical shear stress dependent on the duration of flow? Yeah, yeah that's, uh, you know, we're getting into the basics. And uh, uh, I would say I don't have a good answer for this. Um, it's certainly, I mean, the, 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 the uh, thing that comes to my mind is, uh, you know, the direction of rock plates, for example, the, the, if you have a cut in, in a rock formation and you have a certain inclination, if you flow this way, I don't know if you can see my, my video here, if you flow this way, you're likely to have more erosion than if you flow in the other direction. Uh, so that, that's one case. And I suspect at the level of soil particles, that could also be the case. But uh, if we accept that most, uh, that many soils have a random orientation of particles, then I'm not sure that the direction of flow is going to have a big impact. I know that, you know, in, uh, in coastal areas, where scour takes place along bridges, 
where the water may move in one direction when the tide goes up and the other direction when the tide goes down. I usually uh, take the movement uh, all in the same direction uh, because I don't know how to do that to do the, uh, the, the the problem of reversing the flow. So I, I uh, uh, you know I don't have a good answer for you. And and when, in my practice, I assume that the flow is always in the, the same direction, even though it's it's going to go in the other direction when the tide goes down. Uh, thank you. Anything with respect to duration, the time? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> the, for bridge tower, the software we have for bridge tower uh, takes into consideration the length of, of time because we input the uh, hydrograph. And the hydrograph is uh, velocity versus time. So if you input velocity versus time, uh, the software will calculate how much erosion takes place for each flow uh, value, and it will accumulate that in, uh, so typically a hydrograph will look like this, you know, big storm, high velocity, and then it comes down and then another storm, and then it comes down and another storm, it comes down. And if I plot scour versus time, then it's going to accumulate scour all the time. Oh, here comes another big storm and accumulate. Up another big storm and accumulates. Up a huge storm and accumulates. So the, the scour typically only goes down unless you have infilling of scour holes. Thank you. So there is another interesting question from Vanessa Fernandez. What type of soils do enzymes work? Well, for enzymes, your best uh, chance to have enzymes really um, uh, improve the erosion resistance of soils, you have to have about 15% clay particles. And, and the finer the particles, the better it is. If you have a clean sand, it's not going to work. Uh, and and uh, essentially, the enzymes enhance the, uh, uh, they, they decrease the repulsion between, they, they enhance the, the, it's not like calcium deposits. This is totally different process, but they enhance the, uh, the uh, attraction between uh, fine particles. Uh, and, and this is a developing uh, topic. Uh, I have a PhD student studying that uh, right now and doing some tests with so much percent enzyme, so much percent enzyme, different types of soils to find out when it works, when it, and enzymes are used uh, for, for uh, uh, compaction on the roadways. Uh, so it's, it's not a new field in that sense. We're just using it for erosion protection. So next is from Chung Cho. So his query is, we have got a static river velocity, but with time, with erosion, that velocity gets changed. So how to take care of the change in velocity? Yeah, uh, and we have, uh, you know, the, the, all these are good questions. And I tried to give you an overview of about 30 years of research. Um, the way we, it, so imagine that you have um, the erosion function. So you have erosion rate versus velocity. And you have a first velocity and you go at that first velocity and you go on the curve at the corresponding erosion rate. And you say that first velocity is gonna be there for two hours. So you use that erosion rate for two hours. So 10 millimeters per hour for two hours. Now I've got 20 millimeters of erosion. And then I move in the hydrograph to the second velocity. And that second velocity may be higher. So I move on that new velocity on the erosion function and I find the corresponding erosion rate. And that may be 20 millimeters per hour. And so I use 20 millimeter per hour for the duration of that second velocity, which may be another three hours, let's say. So 20 times three, I've got 
the 60 millimeters, and I add this to the 20 millimeters that I got during the first velocity. And so now I've got 20 plus 60, and I'm at 80 millimeters. And so you step forward like this by reading the hydrograph and accumulating the, the erosion uh, value based on the corresponding erosion rate. So it, it steps into time. It's pretty simple. Yeah. Thank you. Next is from Go. You are talking about the sample for the erosion laboratory test. The sample were pushed upward. What was the rate of pushing upward? It is decided by trial and error or any specific rate? Well, yeah. Uh, so the, the piston, you have, uh, we, we tried a lot of things, but basically the way we do it um, is there is a graduate student that's looking through the window at the sample. And when the sample level goes below the water, the, the, the bottom of the, the flume, the, the conduit, then we push the button and then the sample is moved back up to the level of the bottom of the conduit. So it's by eyesight. So it, it's operator control. We tried all sorts of things. We tried laser beams. We tried the pressure sensors. We tried uh, you know, to try to automate this thing. But as it is, uh, you know, this EFA cost, uh, I don't know, $60,000, $70,000. So if we start going into these automated, uh, you know, that's going to blow the price uh, much higher. So we, we, uh, uh, we've always used uh, graduate students to run those tests uh, with me behind them and teaching them. Um, and, and, and that's, uh, you know, we push the button when we see that the soil sample is below the level of the bottom of the conduit. And that gives us the erosion rate. Thank you. So this is from Tran, Seoul National University. How do you measure the shear stress in laboratory test? Ah, we don't. Well, some people have tried, but it's very complex. Uh, what we do is we use uh, Moody charts. Moody uh, did work on flow in pipes, and uh, he uh, measured the, indirectly, he measured the shear stress on the pipe wall, and we use that uh, chart which uh, goes from the input is the velocity of the water. Uh, let's see, there's the, the hydraulic diameter of the pipe and the roughness of the pipe. So we, we input the roughness of the, of the surface of the soil, of the sample. Uh, we have the, for the, the conduit we have, we have the hydraulic radius. And we calculate Reynolds number and we use Moody chart to transform the velocity into shear stress. We have done some, mine, not, not extensive, but some verifi verification. Um, th this, this is not easy. The problem is this, velocity is much easier to understand. If I tell you the water goes one meter per second, you automatically have a good vision of what it means. If I tell you the water is impacting the soil with a 4.5 Pascal shear stress, while this is more correct scientifically, it's much harder to, to understand and to get a feel for. Uh, so there is a balance between the use of velocity and the use of shear stress. In the software, we typically uh, use the shear stress when we talk to, to uh, people in the business, we, we usually talk in terms of velocity. He has also asked that uh, you are not talking about stopping the erosion. Now, suppose you have to drive the water. Yeah, I mean, and uh, you know, this, uh, this definitely is a very important topic. Uh, we've, uh, we've had a number of projects for the Department of Transportation, the latest being on riprap, uh, because there are a number of uh, riprap failures on slopes 
And uh, the, the issue was how steep a slope should you have uh, so that you can put riprap and the riprap will be stable. And uh, basically we found that a two to one slope is the steepest you should use when you want to put riprap on top of it. Um, so riprap is very common, uh, and, but it has to be used correctly. Uh, the, the filter being most likely geosynthetic and in erosion control for surfaces, geosynthetics uh, certainly is, is the, uh, the favored uh, solution. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Actually, I'm also a fan of your book, Geotechnic oh. Engineering by Unsaturated oh, yeah, yeah, and Saturated yeah. Unsaturated Soil. Yeah, this one there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, all these, so that's why I suggest also all the audience here. So if you go through that book, you'll get better overview of this erosion. Yeah, that's and, true. Uh, yes, I, I actually, uh, I try to go through many of this starting from, and uh, so I'll say if you go through that book also, as an undergraduate student, he will understand the importance of geotechnical engineering. Yeah. Even how, the what is the pressure beneath her foot? And what is how that Eiffel Tower has been built? So that is the uniqueness of that book. So that way, mm. we are trying since long to contact Professor Briard because that book actually it's a lesson for because a combination of professional and academic geotechnical Thank engineering. You. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Uh, actually, I'm working on the second edition now. Uh, there's going to be a, a chapter on case histories, about 20 case histories from the Eiffel Tower to the to many of the very large uh, uh, structures that I've built worldwide. So I'm, I'm excited about it, uh, but it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure yeah. to visit with you. Thank you for the invitation. Have a, have a great visit. <laughs>